please become a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. Get access to everything early. Help us grow. Ian Mills, New Testament Review Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. He will have a Patreon here soon. And when he does, I'll put it down there as well. If it's there, go ahead and join it. Help him out. We were talking about the infancy gospel of Thomas. We spoke about the gospel of Mary, gospel of Thomas. Obviously, the infancy gospel of Thomas is non-canonical, so that means it's fun, I guess. <laughs> if you don't mind, tell me, what is this gospel? So we've looked at a number of Gnostic gospels together. This is not a Gnostic gospel. At least it's not obviously a Gnostic gospel. Um, and unlike the gospel of Thomas and the gospel of Mary, which... Um, have some pretty some teachings that are pretty clearly contrary to what the proto-Orthodox Church would decide is Orthodox Christian theology. Have some, you know, even rejections or repudiations of the canonical Gospels. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas is really just a prequel to the canonical Gospels, and as a result of this, uh, it's actually been really popular throughout the history of Christianity and has influenced Christian art, has influenced Christian teachings about, um, about Jesus. Uh, it and the Proto-Evangelium of James, which is the other sort of prequel gospel, which tells the story of Mary's childhood and then the birth of Jesus. It re-narrates the birth of Jesus. Um, these two texts, uh, unlike the, the sort of Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, um, have in some times, in some places, almost had a liminal liminal um, status in the church. It's not to say they were ever part of the New Testament. We don't have any canons of the New Testament that include these texts. We do have canons of the New Testament that include other texts that are not part of our 27 books. But um, there's, there's never been a time when the infancy gospel of Thomas, so far as I know, so far as the evidence indicates, was bound up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Christians read this. This was popular. And you can still find art in medieval churches. You can still find art in manuscripts that depicts some of these scenes. And this text even influenced uh, the Quranic depiction of Jesus, the depiction of Jesus um, in the Quran. This, um, we have uh, the scenes, famous scenes of Jesus creating birds and Jesus in the schoolroom. That one's not in the Quran, but um, these, these sayings get repeated throughout Christian literature and are important. So, what is the Infancy Gospel of Thomas? Well, it's not the Gospel of Thomas, as we already talked about, but it does claim uh, to be written by Thomas the Israelite, right? And uh, this text starts with Jesus as a five-year-old and tells a series of episodes of Jesus sort of flexing his power, potentially. Um, there's a debate over how to interpret this text. Uh, a certain school of thought has this, the story of Jesus growing in wisdom and power, which is more or less uh, what Luke actually says, right? Luke says that Jesus learned. Luke says that Jesus developed over time. Um, and some people have read this text as sort of a narrative telling. What does it look like for a God incarnate to grow, to develop in wisdom? <laughs> And the answer this text gives to that is when Jesus started off, he was just killing people willy-nilly. A boy would bump into him in the street and he would knock him dead. It, he would, um, he would uh, curse his teacher for criticizing him. Um, this is, this is, um, that's the answer that this text gives us. And then over time... Uh, the, the people of Nazareth come to Jesus' parents and say, you need to teach him to do good, uh, to be merciful, to be caring. And potentially, one reading of this text is that Jesus does. Jesus develops. And so towards the end of the text, we have Jesus healing people, Jesus doing miracles. Um, James gets bitten by a snake. James, the brother of Jesus. And Jesus he heals him. Jesus is helping Joseph. Uh, his construction work. Joseph cuts a board wrong. And Jesus... Uh, lengthens the board. Um, and so you have, on one interpretation of this text, you have Jesus growing uh, in moral character, which is interesting. Um, another interpretation of this is that there is no development, that what this text is trying to do 
is, um, well, I, I should back up. It's conventional in ancient biography to have stories of the child of heroes, of famous people, of um, even, even demigods, I suppose, um, uh, to have stories of these kinds of people doing the things that would make them famous when they were adults. Um, so you'll tell a story of uh, the infant Hercules, you know, going off and doing some show of strength, you know, strangling some snakes in the bed, right? And that's the sort of thing that he's going to do as an adult, um, just retrojected. Kind of like David ends up ripping the jaw of a lion as a youth while he's out there pasturing his flock. Then yep. later he's tearing the head off Goliath. So. Yep. Yep. So the, 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 school, the other school of thought that doesn't see moral development in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas is that this is just showing that Jesus was, could do this all along and that Jesus... Jesus was always the kind of person who uh, had this kind of power. And students, you know, I've, I've taught this text a couple times. Um, students read this and say, this is so radically different from the Jesus we see. I mean, we have Jesus, not only is Jesus doing like nice things, like healing a snake bite and creating clay sparrows and bringing them to life, but he's, you know, he's cursing people and uh, knocking people dead. And maybe that's a little bit different, but... I remind you, Jesus hates figs, right? Jesus comes across a fig tree that's not bearing fruit and it's out of season and he curses the fig tree and says, never bear fruit again. Now that's doing something rhetorically, that's doing something narratively in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew. It's probably a commentary um, on the temple. It's a whole, whole Mark and sandwich where it's being sandwiched in between the story of the um, Jesus's action in the temple. That's not really my point. My point is, uh, Jesus cursing things, Jesus doing acts of power, um, is in the Gospels. And so uh, this, on this other school of thought, is just showing that Jesus could always do these kinds of things. Hmm. Which side do you, I mean, you've taught on this. Yeah. And so this does beg the question, and I'm sure you still get torn in both directions. You're probably like torn in the middle somewhere, but on a good day, yeah. uh, where do you lean? I like the, the moral development story. Um, I think there's some things to be said for this. I mean, this it is described as the, 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 um, the, the paedica. The, it's, it is described as the, the teachings of Jesus. The, the, not the, that's not right. Um, I think there is a case to be made for the moral development view. We get... Uh, this intervention to teach Jesus to start doing good things. And I do think the, the bad, when well, I may say that the, the questionable actions of Jesus are all f are front loaded and the good, at, the obviously nice things Jesus does are all back loaded. Um, that is, they come at the end of the narrative. It does seem to me that there is a sort of development across this story. Um, so that, that makes me wonder if there's a moral development growing in the God of the flesh, Jesus in the flesh being God in the flesh. Okay. Um, well, I kind of have to ask this in the vein of this question. So first dating this text, but in light of Gnosticism, which acts like he has it all from day one, baby yeah. and everything all at once almost doesn't need any growth or de development makes me wonder how early Gnostic ideas were permeating in, in out there, you know, because I wonder if the development idea is kind of a way of saying, listen, even even God in the flesh grew. He had development, which makes me think Luke being a little later, maybe already we're seeing guys coming on going, nope, full God, no need for growth. Yeah, I don't know. Well, OK, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, one of the things is, you know, Gnostic ideas being out there. Again, I've argued, I think it's incontrovertible that Gnosticism isn't a thing. There is not a church of Gnosticism. Gnostic isn't, isn't a coordinated ideology. Rather, it's, um, a, it's one of the many ways, or no, it is actually itself many ways of synthesizing contemporary Platonic philosophy, contemporary ideas about metaphysics and knowledge and ethics with Christian thought. Um, which, proto-Orthodox people did that too. They just did it a little differently. So, um, to say that Gnostic thought was already out there is, of course, itself obviously true, because there were Platonic philosophers before Christianity came around. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's for sure in the air, it's for sure in the water. I'm not sure how much I see this text actually engaging with that explicitly. This text seems to be engaging with the canonical Gospels. It concludes with a story, a retelling, a very close retelling, 
of Luke's description of Jesus as a boy in the temple. Um, the, you know, the pinnacle is Jesus going to the temple and teaching mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the people in the temple. Um, so Jesus, I, I, as, at least as I read this, Jesus grows up into uh, the boy in the temple that we see in the Gospel of Luke, um, teaching people. This wouldn't have any reflection like on the hypostatic union or anything like that? No, I think it's probably too early. You asked about dating this text, and that's right. kind of a hard thing to do. Um, the, the very like debate over the hypostatic union, the very debate over the natures of Jesus, depends on a sort of conceptual apparatus, a way of thinking about metaphysics that just isn't, so far as we can tell, just isn't formulated. People just aren't using that language to talk about Jesus in the first, second, third century. Sure. I mean, okay, they start two in the third, I suppose. But... Um, it, it's not that like that is or isn't biblical, that is or isn't part of first century Christianity. It's just that's not the language people are using. It's not the questions they're asking. Um, so how do we date this text? Well, it, the dating of this depends on how you interpret Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus, I think Irenaeus knows this text. Um, he explicitly quotes one episode from it, which is this episode of the boy Jesus learning his alphabet. Um, but that story is also a very popular story. It shows up in other texts. Um, so some people have suggested maybe Irenaeus just knew this story all by itself or knew it from a different text. It also shows up in the Epistle Apostolorum um, and several other texts. Um, interestingly, this uh, Jesus is being taught Alpha, Beta, and Jesus stops the teacher and says, first tell me what Alpha is, and then I shall tell you what Beta is. And you're supposed to go, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> like um, that is, I think it's emphasizing sort of inscrutability or profound insight. Right. And that's never really fully explained. Um, but I think Marcin actually knows the text as it's found in the Gospel of Thomas based on his description of who's using this text and the other episodes. Uh, he connects this explicitly with other episodes that are in, in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. So I think it's probably... Um, that dates it to before one, the 170s. Uh, and so it's written sometime in the, you know, middle of the second century. Just barely after some of those pastorals, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the dating, you know, dating the composition of the pastorals is a hard question. I know, right? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.